I'm Dick Moberg, and for more than 40 years, I've been developing technology to advance our understanding of the injured brain. I've had a chance to work with some of the leading minds in the field of neuromonitoring, including physicians, researchers, and entrepreneurs. I want to share their stories with you in the form of a weekly podcast so you can stay current on the latest developments in the field and the innovative people behind them. This is my neural network. Hi, I'm Dick Moberg, and uh, today's podcast is on something fairly new and unique to this specialty. It's, it's going to be talking about who takes care of the caretaker. And in traumatic brain injury and pretty much any disease, people take care of those that are, that are injured or, or, or have a medical problem. And in many cases, uh, they are the ones that actually need some help as well. And my two guests here today are uniquely qualified to talk on that. Dr. Barbara Regal, who is a professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Pennsylvania, has recently been studying this. And Dr. Tom Gillespie just went through this with a loved one taking care of them. So welcome, Barbara. Thanks. And welcome, Tom. Thanks, Dick. Thanks. So, Barbara, how did you get into this? This It's pretty interesting. And as I was telling you before, pretty unique, I mean, to really study those people. Uh, Everybody studies the the victim of the or the illness, and nobody studies the people who are taking care of them. I actually think um, as a nurse... Um, that uh, it's a little bit maybe more natural for nurses to begin looking at that whole family dynamic and be looking at the caregivers. But I guess I got into it, uh, maybe started thinking about it probably a decade ago, working with some colleagues, and we were trying to find uh, an area of research that we all shared. And the person I was working with was interested in uh, caregivers of uh, mothers, basically, of um, uh, newborn babies with congenital heart disease. And I realized that in my older population of individuals with heart failure, it was the exact same issue. And so we began kind of looking at our two patient populations and realizing caregivers, you know, it's the same. It's the same thing that's going on. And that's really, I think, how I got into it. No, that's, that's very cool. And so I hear you um, are pursuing this further with a, with a nice grant and had a research. Yeah. Tell us about that. Yeah, NIH um, funded me to do a study of caregivers of adults with heart failure. And uh, we're doing a virtual support intervention, uh, one-on-one health coaches um, on a tablet interacting with the caregiver of these uh, heart failure patients. We're enrolling um, both the caregiver and the patient so that we can see whether or not taking care of the caregiver actually makes outcomes better for the patient as well. And these are really sick patients with uh, heart transplants and ventricular assist devices and uh, and sometimes just run-of-the-mill heart failure, but all of them experiencing um, illness that is severe enough that the caregivers actually need to be putting a fair amount of energy into taking care of them. And I, I have a lot of empathy for this because of the experience that Tom had taking care of his mother. So I, I love it if you could talk a little bit about what that experience was like, Tom. Well, she and a little bit saw, saw this on the side as well as I went through it. And this is a, a loved one. Somebody has to take care of a loved one. And usually it's a solo job. There's one family member. There's some, nobody else geographically available or they're too busy. They can't look it off work. So it falls to one person. It's an individual job. And it's, it's every day, 24 hours a day. It's never off the hook. You're always in demand, and you never get a minute off. So it's all-consuming. I know it was pretty exhausting for you. You know, I had a uh, uh, a very good friend who had a traumatic brain injury. She had um, and has a um, a huge family, a huge family network, and a lot of the care got spread around, and they were able to sort of hand her off to one family just so the others could sort of. Uh, 
recover and, and it's recover from that. Yes, recover. And, and, but with you, Tom, there were no other options, right? No. This was your, your main job. And we brought her down close to our home in San Diego uh, because she could no longer live alone and so I put her in assisted care living because we knew it would be a disaster to bring her in the house for us with the bell ringing every five minutes and uh, things like that. So uh, even with the staff helping out in the, in the assisted care place, there still was like, well, aren't you coming up here this morning? But I've been there for six days, six out of seven days. Well, can't you stay later for tonight? Right. Can't you stay through dinner? And of course, when you add a little dimension into this, uh, then the social graces go away. And then it gets a little brutal and criticism occurs and, and uh, things aren't as nice as they should be. Did you notice anything about yourself changing? I mean, was it, um, what happened to you? Yeah, lost a lot of fondness for my mother. No question about that. Yeah. It, so. And that's a shame because it is, it's yeah. when they need it the most, uh, there True. it goes. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. after such a great life that she gave me yeah. uh, for many, many years, it's really uh, discomforting to see somebody go down uh, the tubes like this and, uh, and become unpleasant. You know, that, that's a really interesting point that Tom just brought up because a lot of the literature on caregiving talks about the incredible satisfaction that people feel when they're able to give back to loved ones. And I think that that is probably the case in many situations that people are able to find some satisfaction in caregiving, I'm sure. But I think it's also important that we recognize that even when there is enjoyment about being able to give to this person that you love, there is incredible stress related to uh, the financial expense, the time expense, the stress, the lack of time for yourself. Uh, we know that statistically, this uh, caregivers give back to society huge amounts of, of money by taking on this load but they often have to quit their own jobs and pay for a lot of care out of their own pockets. Um, uh, AARP did a study saying something like uh, $7,000 uh, per year out of, out of pocket just to be able to take care of this individual that you're not getting paid to take care of them. And so the, the stress and the lack of respite care in so many situations uh, is exhausting to caregivers. And we actually know statistically that um, caregivers often t get ill themselves when the process is over. And so this, we need to do something for these caregivers, clearly. And can you discuss a little more of your research and what you hope to uncover and, and what kind of change it might lead to? Mm -hmm. I'm really excited about the research because we hire these um, three health coaches. They're not therapists, they're health coaches um, to do intervention sessions uh, with the caregivers at the convenience of the caregiver um, and to go through content that addresses self-care. How do you take care of yourself? You know, it's, let's make sure you get enough sleep. You know, don't, if you're ill, don't ignore it and go to the doctor, take care of yourself. Make sure you get a flu vaccination. Take time, it's okay to take a break for yourself. Just going through all of these um, issues about uh, that it's not just about putting all of your energies into this person that you're taking care of. It's what Tom alluded to, I can't be there 24 seven, I have to have some time for myself and that's okay. You have to have time for yourself because if they don't have any time for themselves, then they're going to burn out. And then what's happened, what's left with this person who has traumatic brain injury, who has dementia, who has severe heart failure, who has cerebral palsy, who has congenital heart disease, whatever the many, many conditions that require someone to step up to the plate and take care of that individual, whatever it is, that person has to be able to go for the long haul. 
So they have to take care of themselves. Right. And, and um, I, I think it's, it's probably like driving in a car. You're going somewhere quickly to an emergency or something and your engine light comes on. Well, if you don't take care of it, Mm-hmm. You're, yeah. you're not going to get there. You're not going to get there. <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I think it's, uh, and it's probably the awareness. People don't have a life that comes on and says, take care mm-hmm. of yourself. They really don't. And, and so people miss it. And, and uh-huh. that's probably what you're trying to get out there is, yeah. is give them the awareness that yeah. their engine lights on. Right. The other piece of that, I think, is that most of the caregivers are women. And women's role, yes. even in our society, is to, is to take care of themselves last, and they don't. Yeah. Oh, that's a good point. And yeah. we have not been successful thus far in the mm-hmm. grant of uh, engaging male caregivers. They don't like being called caregivers, and they, don't, they uh, would rather set things in place to take care of uh, somebody else to take care of this person who needs the care. And it's oftentimes the women that are in there going, okay, I'll quit my job, and I'll do what needs to be done. You know, you mentioned the, uh, the out-of-pocket cost, the $7,000. I wonder if anyone's um, quantified the, the other costs. The, the, um, well, what about the, the, the mental toll or any of these others? But um, yeah, if there's others, because I, I bet this uh, is a much more significant problem than, um, you know, than we think of. This AARP study was done in 2013, but they said that there are 40 million family caregivers providing 37 billion hours of care worth $470 billion annually. That nobody pays for, right? That nobody pays for. Nobody pays for. We have a lot of national discussion now about health care costs and how expensive it is to go into the hospital into and 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 should we be paying physicians nurses less but you know we're not paying these caregivers anything right and, and well we are actually yes. i shouldn't say that there's now a program that um uh, you can apply uh for the caregiver your daughter your son, your whatever, um, if that person is going to spend time caring for you, I think it's a minimum wage job, but they do get some reimbursement mm-hmm. for their time if you apply for that. And that's, that is a good thing that's happened. Well, that's a, that's a step. Um, you know, I think we were talking a few days ago about the cultural differences. Like in the, in, yes. in Europe, you know, you, we all travel a lot. You, uh-huh. I know you guys do, and I yeah. do. And um, in Europe, it's a little different uh, where the family stays yeah. in one house for generations and in the U.S., nobody's around. You know, we're yeah. all in different cities. So yeah, like, we're all in different cities. Yeah. Everybody yeah. mobile. Yeah. yeah, like in Germany. <laughs> yeah, the three, you know, the three generations and stacked up in one house. Yeah, yeah, right, right. And, and I know I do a lot of work in Italy, and yeah. the norm there is family caregivers. Right. That is the societal norm. What people are expected to do. Does that mean that they don't have the stress of caregiving? I don't think so. But I think it just means that maybe. They have more of the shared uh, right. situation that you described with your friend, with all the family and friends right. that came together and shared the load. Maybe because it's a cultural norm, they share the load more. We often don't. Yeah. No, and, and, and as you alluded to, the expense of this, and a lot of people, most families can't afford to hire somebody else to come in. Yes. Or they can't afford it's just a living place. And so they end up doing it themselves. Yeah, I had a friend who was from Australia and he... Um, he actually left and went back home because his mother needed care, even though there were family there. But it's, and he was actually Greek living in Australia, and it was just a a family bond that you don't see yes. uh, too much in this culture. It's really interesting. Mm-hmm. Uh, but but your your point is good that no matter who does it, the stress is there. And yes. um, so I think what you're doing really has meaning to to every culture. It has to do with yeah. Yeah, so what we're hoping from this research is that we'll decrease the stress, improve the self-care in these caregivers, maybe improve the outcomes in the patients, but but importantly, develop a model that can use uh, technology, FaceTime, you know, uh, other kinds of web video technology where we can reach out to people, even in rural settings, um, to give the support across conditions. This is, we're testing it in heart failure, but uh, it can be, this intervention could be used. Uh, there's really nothing heart failure specific about it. 
Sure. But what about the, um, you know, when a family member starts to care for another family member, they're, they're rarely trained to do that. And, um, you know, a caretaker that you hire has some training for that. I would imagine that also leads to stress. I mean, you don't even know how to take somebody to the bathroom, especially if it's like a, a relative, you know, or your yeah. mother and pull their pants down and sit them on the toilet. I had yeah. to do that with my friend. And it was like, you know, that was an wow. eye opener for me. But, you know, then you just get used to it. But yes. uh, she was a, a, a friend my age. But doing that for my mother would be difficult and <laughs> probably a little stressful too. So uh, you have brought uh, up yeah. such an important issue I, let me say one thing, and then I, actually I want to I want Tom to comment on that as as well of the the family dy dynamics there. But one thing that we're we're seeing in the literature is that people are being expected; these family caregivers are being expected to do unbelievable medical tasks. I mean, if you think about um, you know you're administering all these medications; that's what nurses do. Your, um, we are uh, enrolling these ventricular assist device uh, patients where they're, they have a, a device inside the body to uh, basically um, control the heart. And it's possible to have a catastrophe with those devices and they go home with a loved one. Okay, now change that dressing, uh, keep an eye on so-and-so. And if you're not used to that kind of thing, it's pretty scary. Yeah, so if that light comes on, don't unhook that thing. Yeah, really. <laughs> but what about like your mom and this whole issue of putting your mother on the toilet? Yeah, that, that and you know, uh, addressing her constipation and things like that that I shouldn't have to be doing uh, as a as a son. And uh, yeah. uh, this is difficult. This is a difficult area for for people who aren't trained. As a physician, that's easy for me, but still stressful to have to do that with your mother. Uh, I think for people who have no no medical nursing health training, it's, it's they just get sent home with these people and don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so they they've had you know maybe a, an hour, a few hours, maybe a, even a day of some patient education and some training, but then you go home and there you are by yourself thinking, oh, <laughs> <laughs> now what? Right, right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And Tom. Um, you know, um, I should tell our listeners, you're a retired cardiologist. And I'm, and I'm just wondering, um, in your in your sort of medical career, uh, what, what, taking care of your mother, did that sort of open your eyes to what maybe some of your patients were going through that maybe you weren't aware of this? Or, or were you aware of this? Uh, in, no, uh, I think it was an eye opener because Barbara had not started this research at that point. This was several years ago. And so, um, yes, this was an eye opener to finally have to do it. My father died many, many years ago and, and my mother cared for him. I was away at medical school and, uh, and this is the first encounter I've had that I had in the, uh, was taking care of her. Yeah. It, br so, it brings a different that, sort of yeah, perspective it, to that. A great deal of empathy for the, the, mm -hmm. the family that takes care of these patients that I sent home, uh, that are still fairly, fairly ill. Right, right. I, I remember when my friend got a uh, got her head injury, and I've been in the um, uh, brain injury business for many years, and I, I would go into hospitals, and and it's sort of sad to say, but the patients were sort of invisible to me. I was always looking at the technology, you know, and I'd pass room to room and look at, wow, they have this kind of monitor in there. You get, you get used that, to it. And, and then, I'm, I'm sure. And then um, when she had her head injury, it just, um, everything became... Uh, different mm -hmm. you know these were people and you wonder what was their families like and, and what is, what's going to happen to them and mm -hmm. really changed my perspective after all these years she was the first person i really uh really knew that had a bad head injury like this mm -hmm. so and i would imagine this is um i mean you see it probably coming from nursing barbara quite oh, probably a lot more than i would say i'm a, a physician or someone like that though, no so. the physician sees you in the hospital then you get sent home and and that's all fine until the next office visit right, so right. that's a black box out there yeah, yeah unless you start to think about it right or unless uh, you've done it right uh, that's interesting so how long is your project uh, and the research in it's a five-year project, wow. and um, we are—we uh, just finished our first year in a couple of months, 
uh, and we're um, trucking along on uh, enrollment and uh, having week weekly meetings with our health coaches to address some of the issues. Um, a couple of the patients have died and that's kind of upsetting to the health coaches. So I feel like I'm uh, supporting both the caregivers and the coaches <laughs> and, and one of the research staff was so traumatized by the patients dying that she quit. And so then I feel like, so um, uh, people ask me, are you still nursing? And I, I always have trouble with that question because I don't see patients anymore, but I feel like I'm always nursing. I'm always yeah, yeah. supporting yeah. somebody. And yeah. somebody's going to have to look after you soon. Yeah, right? <laughs> that's what I have him for. She's become the caregiver for her right. staff. Right, right, right. right. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. It, it's an exciting project, though. I feel like it's like it's important and it's meaningful. And every once in a while, we get little love notes from the caregivers going, "This is one wrote a poem uh, to to thank us for the wonderful support that she was getting," and, and another one just wrote an email saying, "I love the workbook that you gave us. I'm learning so much." And so I feel like we're doing some good stuff. So, so what do you see as the um, as the, not so much the goal, but what? How would you like? Um, healthcare to change based on your work? I mean, n not just your study, but, you know, way beyond that. What what should either society or healthcare, whatever, do to uh, help these caretakers? Or, or where do you see it? Um, I don't think it's just my work, but I do. I am very excited about uh, an evolution that I'm seeing in the scientific community with more emphasis on dyads and um not not just um, caregivers and not just patients and not just individuals, um, but to really focus on, and for many years we've focused on the, um, the family and the community, but I think there's something unique going on in a dyad, in a, in a couple, whether it's a mother and a child or a uh, husband and a wife, or a couple of guys, or a couple of women, or whatever the the closeness of this uh, of these two people going through this particular event that I think has a lot of lessons for us to learn. I've always felt like marriage is sort of a black box. You look at a couple and you don't really know what goes on in that couple, and then you find out that. Somebody just got murdered and you think, well, gosh, you know, or whatever the, or, or else they've been married for 50 years. And you think like, what, what was going on in that black box? Mm. So I feel like this is insight into that black box for me. And that's something that really excites me about this kind of research. Oh, that's very cool. Well, hopefully, um, hopefully the world of change, at least the world of caretakers will change based on your research. I, I think it's uh it's certainly something needed. And, and before I talk to you, it just, I don't even think about this, but uh, it's so glad people like you, so glad people like you are thinking about this. You know, it's amazing. Yeah, good. it's good. Any, um, any final thoughts or anything? Or, but, no, um, I, I sort of feel like that was sort of final thought right there. Okay, yeah. yeah that was, that was very it's fun good. to talk yeah. through some of these issues. Yeah, well, th this has been uh, eye-opening for me, and let me thank both of you for sharing your, um, your thoughts and your work with us. That's great, you're doing this. Yeah, thanks for thanks for asking. So, thanks for listening to this week's podcast. If you enjoy these interviews, please take a moment to rate and review this show on your podcast app of choice. Subscribe to Dick Moberg's Neural Network to receive notifications when future installments are available. Thanks for tuning in, and we hope you'll join us again soon.